Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Holistic Human Optimization Show. I'm your host, as always, Ronnie Landis. And as many of you know that have been following, this is one of the very last um, episodes in a four-year-long episode series that I think this is episode 190 or 191, something like that. Quite the journey we have been on. Um, literally interviewing masters and incredible experts, thought leaders, um, just people in every branch of the human uh, the human experience, you know, and really human optimization um, from every area, every angle that you can think of. Evolutionary human optimization is one word I like to use, and uh, that is definitely relative to the the individual in the conversation that uh, we're bringing forth today. This individual is Michael Tessarian. This is the third interview that we have done together for this podcast. And uh, we, I mean, we have dove into incredible territory, diversity of territory. If you have not heard the last two interviews we did together, I think it's episode, there's one is 166 and 162, something like that. Just go back through the Rolodex. You'll find those. And as I was um, thinning out the list of guests that I wanted to create kind of the conclusion for this segment, we'll see where it goes in the future, but I have other plans for the podcast. And um, I thought like, who are the last couple people I would like to bring their voices on? And Michael Tessarian came up immediately. So here we are. And, um, you know, my, just a little, just for those who don't know Michael, Michael is in my estimation, my opinion, and also my experience, it, Michael is one of the one of the leading voices, and when I say leading voices, I, you know, just one of the most expert voices in many different fields of the human condition, spirituality, practical spirituality, metaphysics, um, human history, sacred archaeology, I'd probably even throw in there because he's done a ton of work in unearthing a lot of the misconceptions, a lot of the myths, and a lot of the truths um, in that area. And there's so many other things I could say too. Let's just say that Michael is one of the leading proponents and one of the most respected teachers in the truth movement. And I would even say human potential movement from my perspective, because his work bridging philosophy and psychology is second to none. And that's why I've, I've taken on to his work. And actually, Michael, I've incorporated and integrated a lot of the, the metaphysical, philosophical and developmental psychological points of view and in, in things that you've brought on to bear um, and a lot of voices of the past that I wasn't as familiar with that you've really kind of brought through that maybe kind of would have gone lost in the wayside, like Walter Russell or Heidegger or some of these great philosophers, even your perspectives on Carl Jung are unique. So it's kind of brought these voices back into my awareness. And then, um, you know, it's been great to integrate a lot of that work into my work. So anyways, without further ado, Michael, it's a pleasure to have you on again. How are you doing? Oh, great, man. Uh, I'm glad we got to do it today. As uh, I cl totally clued out and uh, kept you waiting three hours for, you know, the time differential and everything like that. But um, that's what happens when you tunnel vision on projects. You know, uh, it takes a whole week to just do one of the podcasts. I'm sure you know that. You're always thinking, writing it down, researching it. There's no time off at all to get Sunday's podcast ready and maybe even three or four podcasts ahead of time. You know, the whole week is taken up. And this this day, today, I just got totally tunnel vision. I had to write down all these thoughts. Looked up, and three hours have gone by. I said, what the hell? You know, oh, my God, there's Ronnie's email. So <laughs> I really apologize for that. But it's great to be with you again and, you know, carry on this uh, discovery. And as you're quite right, the, it's, it's all about honoring the, the mentors from the past. That, however, I must say, that does not mean then, in nine times out of ten, you know, that I'm wearing the T-shirt. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that I subscribe then to everything such and such said. You know, you get this internet, you know, uh, community who thinks that the, just the very mention of a man's name, you must be then, you know, whatever, right? right? And they have no discernment. They don't say, look, do you realize that there's gems from this person? It's like a buffet. You know, you, you, everyone brings, you know, a potluck that you're having. And you can be blown away. You may not even like the person, but the, the potluck that they bring, you know, to the potluck, the, the, the meal that they bring, the, the cooking that they are, the cooking, you know, the, the, what they've brought could just blow you away. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their particular contribution. And uh, that's huge. You know, so that means that I can then look at somebody from the Frankfurt School. I can look at somebody from the left. I can look at an atheist. 
and see gems in their work. Now, I, I think, sadly, I'm one of the few people who can do that. Other people, when they see that the person's, you know, whatever, they throw it across the room. But do you know what you're losing with that? We're here, we're here, you know, the boat is sinking, you need the manual, and you're worried about, you know, the cover, the name sounds Jewish or something? <laughs> yeah, okay, be my guest, be whale fucking droppings then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go right on ahead. You know, this is, this is nonsense. And as I've always said, this is holy work. And therefore, you know, the true aria is not about race. The true aria is not about, ca you know, uh, uh, financial, you know, success or anything like that. There's people who are absolute corporate executives who read William Blake on their lunch break. Mm. Okay, get the point? Right. So, you know, this, this spirituality cuts across a lot of ground, you know, and so does sanity. And yes. you get insanity, you know, everywhere, you know, at the highest and the lowest level. So, yeah, the spiritual man is really an outsider. And he is able to, he should be free in his consciousness attitudinally, you know, to be able to pick up a Colin Wilson, a Martin Heidegger, a Nietzsche, you know, an Ayn Rand, you know, an Erich Fromm, you know, uh, all knowledge is not territorializable. Well, actually, they do try to territorialize it, but that's where you know that you're dealing with fakes now. You know, you can't urinate on it like a blinking dog and say, this is my territory. And history is much greater than you. Mm. There's been intellects 20 times, you know, what I am and what, what most people are. Learn from those people and learn with reverence. Otherwise, it's not love of knowledge. It's not philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's grabbing the knowledge or, you know, it's grabbing the power and the sense of egoism that you feel with that power, a totally different animal than loving the knowledge and entering into a deep relationship. So it can continue to teach you. Yes. You know, yeah, that, that's essential. I think this, this, um, <clears throat> this is a great way to open this up because this brings up a number of things. Um, you know, one of, one of my teachers that I really appreciate and listen to uh, Greg Braden, um, one of the great quantum physicists, kind of people bringing that information and that kind of practical scientific pers um, perspective on a lot of scientific um, or the, you know, spirituality and science together. One of the things that he mentioned was that, um, I think it was Khalil Gibran, he was mentioning a quote from him saying that um, work is love made visible. And I thought, wow, what an incredible quote, because it's not a transactional or vending machine approach to the work that we do in fact there's nothing and it's it's kind of reciprocated in its own effort towards whatever the work is right it's for the love of it in other words and i think that's a missing component i want to i want to um i definitely want to get your take on that because the the spiritual perspective or in your language the vocational man or woman is different than the occupational man or woman and we live in a world where people are more concerned with their occupation and their recreation than they are with their vocation but we also notice that the majority of people that die particularly of a heart disease also die on monday morning before they're getting ready to go to work um, doing a job that I don't know if that's a completely accurate s statistic, but it is a statistic nonetheless. There is a correlation with people that end up having heart failure or heart attack um, on a Monday morning, which I find very revealing of the society that we live in, where people have placed more of their, their inner resources and their attention on what they're doing for a living than actually living in of itself. And I, I'd love to maybe get your perspective on that. That's so huge. And I, I agree with that. I think it's true because uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to come at that. But the basic way to say it is that uh, a man's thinking in terms of the outsider, the, 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 the chance of you living inauthentically is higher when you're just a recreational and an occupational person. It doesn't cancel out authenticity because there's obviously authentic road sweepers. It's all in here, remember, right? But generally speaking, right, when you're dealing with outsider people, the outsider doesn't take refuge and hide away from his true calling, his dharma, in recreational or occupational. He can enjoy our pizza like everybody else. He can enjoy surfing and, and you know, walking with a dog or the sunset. You know, he, he, does, he does all three. I heard, who was it? Oh, it, some idiots were made a program on Krishnamurti and were faulting the guy because he liked to eat apples and he liked to go and get... His, go to see his tailor and get his hair cut and all these things. What is it you think the sage is then, may I ask? Some guy who sits on a bed of nails all day? Is that what you have to have? The sage right. is all men. He can kick a ball around. He can drive fast cars like Krishnamurti did. Mm -hmm. He can think mm -hmm. of a partner. 
put them back together again. He was a good mechanic. He watched Clint Eastwood movies even on his deathbed. <laughs> yeah. That's a fact, right? Yeah. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The greatest mystics are all other kinds of men. So they're they're fully immersed in the world, is what you're saying. They're not they're not in some weird spiritualized box that they're like subjugating themselves to. They're worldly. They are fully in the world. And uh, 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 you know, I watched the snooker, right? You know what I mean. You have to. You have to have. A, you know, even Plato said that the man who the philosopher king must must have something else that he does more important than the function that he serves in the public, even if it's a philosopher king. Wow. What do you do otherwise? Oh, I collect stamps. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Even if it's Monday, oh, I look after <laughs> orchids. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm into my orchids. Oh, thank God, he's got actually, right? So it's spread a lot. It's, so you can bring authenticity into occupation. You can be an authentic sports person, yes. right? Yes. Uh, uh, and a recreationalist, right? a, a great curmudgeon, a great raconteur. You know, but there's something deeply authentic in in that person. Um, mm -hmm. But then, if you really pare it down, okay, wait a minute. You know, there's a what? What about this vocational man? As I said, he is all men. He has fun. He cracks jokes. He likes or ordinary things. But the difference is that he's authentic because he's answered the call, not from outside, but from within. Whereas the occupational man is is saying, "I listened to my dad. He wanted me to be a lawyer, and that's exactly what I am." Eighty years later. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. You know, uh, my, 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 all my pals went in to be policemen, you know, et cetera. We know the type. Mm -hmm. And that's where they stay. But from the point of view of the outsider, the, the sort of psychologist, philosopher type would say, and that's where they've hidden. They hide in the light. They hide in the noise. Right. So the, the way to answer this is that the vocational man hasn't turned up the world noise so much that he can't hear the calling inside. And then when he heard it inside, you know, said, so go be a poet. He went and be become a poet. Now, the strange thing about the vocation is that vocational voice might say, go become a lifeguard. Go sweep the streets. Go, um, you know, be a lollipop man leading kids across the street. In, in fact, it does. It can be, go be a truck driver. Right? Go be a farmer. Put down that thing and go and do that. That voice is part trickster. <laughs> right? And so you have to say, Oh, uh, go keep chickens? What are you telling me that for? I want to do that. But, but if you're authentic, you'll say, right, where are the chickens? I'm off. Because there's a calling. And everyone thinks it has to be something mighty. Super grandiose. Right? Yeah. Like everybody's an incarnate. You know, my past life, I was Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Yeah, we've heard that one. <laughs> how many, right? And how many parallel dimensions is that happening? <laughs> Shit, you know? <laughs> but nobody ever says, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was a little man living on a beach in Scotland, right. picking up oranges, picking up oranges on the beach, you know, uh, and living a very quiet, simple life. Hardly said three words my whole lifetime because I've been listening to the waves. Wow! Wow! Mm -hmm. All that needs to be said doesn't need to be said. <sighs> right? That is when you've attained it. Mm -hmm. The rest is the noise. And the kerfuffle, but the noise is okay as well because that's where you start in our critiques of you know Eckhart Tolle recently and the the uh, prosperity cult. We were bringing that out that yeah. look, yeah. there's you know that um, there is no higher and lower self. These are nice metaphors; they work descriptively. But yeah. when you really are at the right perspective, seeing all that, you realize there's no such thing. There's interconnected selves. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. and the, yeah. the mind has beautifully pared down one antenna to say, "Well, worldly shit needs to it comes through better on this frequency," right, and then the other shit from the archetypes is better with this setup, this hi-fi, this this speaker, right? Whoa, get the real woofers on there. Yes, that's yes, the way that's it's meant to be. Yeah, th well, this is really interesting that you bring this up because what I get from that is that it's a directional thing versus a definition in of itself, right? Like it's it's giving you direction, so it's not necessarily that your quote unquote, because that's, that's divisionistic. That's how we've been trained through Darwinian philosophy and all this survival of the fittest is kind of hierarchical kind of thing of like, oh, that's my higher self. So that would mean that I'm who I am used to being is my lower self. You may be in your lower chakra, but that doesn't mean you as a totality is lower than your possibility. It means that there's a potentiality that you can strive towards. But what I'm, what I, so I think that's interesting. And also on that note, 
um, what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that it's more about integration. So from the vocation, the recreation, and the occupation, it's not about separation or segregating anyone or anyone's better. It's that we integrate recreation. Like, yeah, I hope you have something fun that's self-care and self-enjoyment that isn't all just about carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders because that we've seen, we, we, we don't need any more martyrdom, right? So yes, we, recreation is important. Then the occupation, how are you going to provide for yourself and your family or your community, whatever your thing is. You're not just gonna be a beggar on the street promoting philosophy. You need to actually take care of your, your worldliness, right? And then the vocation is whatever your soul is calling you to contribute or whatever that is, right? That's what I just got from everything you're saying. Maybe, um, so like the integration of everything versus like kind of the hierarchical kind of right and wrong or better than, better or worse. Mm. It's a rhythm of, like any river, right? There's narrow and wide. It's, it's a rhythm. It's never going to be monotone. It's never going to be gray wall, wall, right? But your chakra thing is a good example. Uh, there's there's going to be seven chakras, but what a lot of people don't realize is that all the chakras are in a single chakra. Mm. In the chakra one is the seventh. In the seventh is the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're, sim they're simultaneous. They're all occurring at the same time, like a harmonic symphony versus like, Oh, you're living in your root chakra. It's like, yeah, okay, but, but you know, they're all they're all happening. That's right. And and say you pluck a chord. In the, to the, I said I said it this way in the Jungian terms, anything that the ego does, any move it makes, any thought, th the self hears it. It's like ding ding, bells are ringing, you know, over the horizon, and the self knows the Morse code of it. it goes, oh, there's what the ego is doing now. So there's a there's a call and response, and so. <laughs> So in the lowest chakra is the highest, right? If this is the meditation, in the lowest of the lowest places, William Blake said it like this. He's always polemical, right? But he said, even hell is divine. Because if God made it, it's divine. Right. right. So the, there can never be a place of darkness in which the spirit, since the spirit made all, even in hell, if you know where to look and you know how to feel, the, divine, the divinity is there as much as it's in the highest heaven. Mm. Right? Now that is a, only a mystic can know that, right? So basically what this means is then that even the most humble uh, aspect of your thinking, so the Eckhart Tolle thing about really splitting and dividing is, is false, right? The, high, the lower self, what we call the ego, egoic self, is perfectly designed. Yeah, it goes wrong for other re reasons to do with society, but yeah. it is yeah. perfectly designed to register all the data of that superficial, empty vocational uh, non-vocational world the other side has got uh, you know a separate set of uh, 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 you know sonics and, and audio and video for a greater you know uh, sense of oneself because it's bigger there's a bigger self you need a different kind of you know to speak in modern language pixelation you know and mm -hmm. and, uh, and what's the word i'm looking for high def Yes. High def you is not going to work on some little dial up, you know, no way. It's not going to come through, not even close. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a month. So there's a credible, like the lamina scate, you know, above the magician's head in the tarot. It's an interactive flow. Like you say, a, a call and response and a, and a moment of integration, but even that integration isn't static. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just such a flow, and people don't understand that. And they don't understand the role of the body. They don't understand the role of, uh, you know, the master-slave relationship with the body or with another person. There's so much still missing in this narrative, you know. And so my work tends to focus on that, not just because I, you know, sign on for a particular philosophy, but because I find that in the philosophies are things of such preciousness we've got they're invaluable tools in this in this nightmare we're in a, we're mm -hmm. being assaulted on a daily basis by subliminal programming by all forms of pathogens and toxins you talk about it all the time mm -hmm. and there's many uh defenses that we can use against it so we're not pulled over and so we're not exhausted and so that we can fight back and do good in the world right that that uh, that requires you to be like out of a samurai level like yeah. a freaking ninja level it really does and of course people are going to fall by the wayside and not manage it because they don't integrate these tools Okay, this is this is um, this is bringing up something I, I, I have to mention and um, we're going in such a I mean, it's all the organic flow. It's all leading us in the, the ultimate context here. But um, so I mentioned Greg Braden. I just want to mention something that he revealed in one of his uh, Gaia episodes, which I've been obsessively watching. There's just been like amazing downloads and information. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned about quantum physics 
and he related it to um, quantum particles, basically how they interact in the body. And I got this mind blowing epiphany of something I intuited, basically in the, the nature of transformation. So I'll try to make this brief. He said that there's three basically like energetic um, uh, uh, phenomenons that happens from the, the particle perspective, or just let's just say your, your energy field as a person. So there's, there's the, there's the, the, um, what do you call it? The implosion or the internal. So basically the, the cell or the energy vortex is internalizing. The energy is going inward. So it's like, it's like a toroidal kind of thing, right? Like it's that toroid. It's all coming. It's in, it's in constant movement, but it's going internal. Then the other one is that it's coming from within and it's coming out from a central place. It's coming out into the external right if you follow that and then he said now the third is this the third is really what we need to pay attention to where the pulse the energy pulse isn't going out or in it's stable and it's pulsating in place and what what i got from that was like oh my god what he's talking about is the quantum mechanics of transformation because when the energy isn't like constantly going out 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 right you know, whatever, we're giving our gifts, we're, we're, we're overflowing, right? But nothing's coming back in. Or it's always like taking in, consuming, consuming, consuming. But what happens when we stabilize? You know, from an identity perspective, we are who we are and we're in our, and this is what you talk about, we're centered. And this has become more powerful for me relate, lately where I've been doing more um, somatic work instead of more intellectual work. I've been like, if I, these concepts are not in my body, then they're not real. I got to get this embodied, embodied. I got to get in my body. And so as I've stabilized that energy, I've noticed like wherever I go, I'm not being pulled out. And I'm not so in where I'm like dislocated from the world. I'm fully embodied and able to interface and navigate with whatever I'm being put up against. And I just, I just wanted to mention that. I don't know if I articulated it the best way, but I, I, you know, I, I feel like you're nodding, so I feel like you have some perspective on that. It's, it's perfect, it's perfect. Uh, it, what he's talking about there, Brayden, is, is a very old mystical concept. Mm. And we can get it maybe into that in a minute if it's relevant. But the way that I explained exactly what you said before in my work is that, remember the fool card, he's, 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 his sigil is zero. And what they're trying to show is that even though he's clearly on a journey, even in the old decks, he's walking and a little dog or something is following him. Around. So he's obviously on a, he's a journeyman. Yeah. But since his symbol, a sigil is zero on a circle, you're always at the exact, you're always at the same place all, you know, at any given time, no matter how much you walk on that circle, you're equidistant from the past and the future. So the movement is a stillness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What the hell, right? So this is extraordinary. And so that your journey, you think you're moving forward. You can feel your movement and you look back and you're getting further away from the mountain. But actually you're standing still mm -hmm. because you're on a circle. If you're on a straight line, yes, then this rule would apply. Mm. You know, but you're not. So you're on a spiral or you're on a circle. And so movement is now somewhat illusionary, right? Mm. And this mm. takes us into many, many diff different directions. But... It's very similar to what Walter Russell also taught. And the idea is inhale, exhale, enfolded, right? And then uh, the implicate and the explicate order, yes. right? Yeah. So that monad that you're talking about, and it's interesting that, you, you know, the meditation pose is that where you're quite right. These two fingers are coming together at a point. That's very interesting, right? And that's so, the muscle test, by the way, right? If it goes, it if is. it breaks, it's weak. Yeah. But if it stays, it's strong. In kinesiology, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and see, and we're grounded. We own our own spot. Nobody can occupy right. the ground I'm actually standing on. There's a lot to this, actually. Yes. But the thing is that um, that point, which is the still point, which is spirit, even when it's giving out explicitly, it's giving to itself. When, it impli when it's implicate, it returns to itself. So yeah. I would say that um, thinking in terms of what Walter Russell is saying is that there really, and others have said it too, that there really is no time. Mm -hmm. There's only a, a, a eternity seen, seen from a different, you know, seeing itself from a different perspective, right? Where spirit itself, in some sense, has a subjective and objective a way of observing itself. Mm -hmm. And we share that, right? We have a right brain and a left brain. But what you're really seeing is some sort of a, 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 a or let, let's put it like the way that Whitehead did, that, that uh, Alfred North Whitehead. He was trying to 
not trying, he succeeded in destroying the argument of cause and effect. Because remember, all religion and science is, is majorly screwed by this problem, which is that for anything that exists, there must be something pre-existing it to cause it, including God. This affects, as I said, not just science, but religion. Because if there's a God, who, where did it come from? They call it the ground, but we don't want to get into all of that. Where, what pre-existed God? How can God be his own cause? Since the rule that is evident all through the universe is that everything must have a cause. Well, then what caused God? So, you know, guess what? Not, there's a lot of people who've solved it, but you ain't ever heard of them because of our system of, you know, this is what my work features, right? But anyway, Whitehead said, all things cause themselves. All things are their own cause. So there, there doesn't need to be a pre-existing cause, like a billiard idea of this cause had to knock that. The universe itself throws up itself. There's no such concept as this sort of a domino billiard ball effect, right? Mm -hmm. Of a linear understanding, right? So it's because so, that would happen if your left brain is seeing particulars. If you see the universe as these dots, like I said, you know, or time in time, time is linear, right? Yep. But once you subtract all of those things, you just see a consciousness and a being that is expressing itself pretty much like our own imaginations do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't say what my one thought caused this other thought or this fantasy I had out of it came another fantasy. That's not how your imagination actually works. Cause and effect is no, is not the case in imagination. And, and that's actually not a, a case in most right brain thinking, right? It is with the left brain. So Whitehead is saying that you must see that the whole universe thinks and imagines and fantasizes. And we're, we're one of the, you know, phantasmagoria, so to speak, or hologram. I don't mean that in the scientific way. We are, you know, we are imaginings of the great imaginer, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's all of this to bear in mind. And then we think back towards, we, we embody, right? those imaginings and respond to them in a call and response way as well. So it's more like a dialogue and a conversation. The only trouble is that we've, because of ancient ancestral trauma, something has gone wrong. And the ego then, you know, grew out of the grave of the self. So we're, dual, we're dualistic in both positive and negative ways. Mm -hmm. There's a real positive dualism as well, but there's also the negative one. And then what has happened in more recent times is that the midwelt or the society has become so poisoned, right, that it's bringing up children as we damn well know, because we've had the Steiners and everybody else t making yes. it abundantly clear uh, that there's a travesty going on, and therefore the child is now made into basically a left brain creature, and that is a synonym for censorship. The right brain is free-flowing, giving, and, and non-censoring, and the left brain is the censor that says, thou shalt not express, yeah. thou shalt not feel, and thou, thou shalt be desensitized. And what do you think is the first place of that, where that desensitization manifests? It's your own body. Yeah. So then from that, you have overeating. You can't tell. See, look at it this way, to bring it up to contemporary times. When you see all of these overweight socialist types, right, these social justice warriors and all these, uh, you know, feminists and all, mm -hmm. they're always telling you they're sensitive. They're always, I'm very sensitive. That's why I, I lose it. I get triggered. I'm very sensitive. And I've always said to them, you are not sensitive because if you, were, if you were, you wouldn't overeat. Yeah, you're unstable, but you're, yeah. not, you're not sensitive. How can you be sensitive and then be 400 pounds? Right. There's a fucking oxymoron here somewhere. I'm, uh, I don't know where it is, but you know, the sensitive person doesn't treat their body like a garbage dump. Yeah. Well, so I, don't keep verbally telling me, see, this is the schizo, schizogenic yeah. society that okays yeah. and normalizes pathology. Mm. The pathology is if you were sensitive, even a lot, you do, you, I'm sorry, you've read the wrong definition. You must have got a, you know, a dictionary that was written by a, an insane person, the definitions, mm -hmm. because it, sensitivity means you could never treat your body right. in such a disgusting, uh, violent way. Because yes. that's what bulimia and anorexia and overeating and all of these things are. Yes. So I hope people see the logic of this, that the sensitivity I'm talking about is the real one. But the left brain has created a schizogenic mind mm. that, can, that uh, desensitizes you. And this is the real, real essence of it. Because once your body is, well, first of all, when your mind is desensitized and then your body becomes this alien thing that you're killing by foods, big brother's job's made easy. Yeah, yeah. And it's just as simple as that. That's the loop. You know, yeah, that's then, the connection. You know, and then they'll they'll get you because you are emotionally unstable, chemically and, and otherwise, un, you know, developmentally. It's easy for them to get you all hopped up and roped into the next activism, the next public march, the next thing, climate change. What we're seeing right now and this whole kind of thing, 
and it's like there's good intention but completely misguided application execution because while you're doing that and they're putting on the cameras over there okay the new vaccine bill just got passed the new 5g bill just got passed like all that's it's it's clockwork it's happening every time it's a misdirection that's what they're doing misdirection and um without going on that because ultimately I think we're setting the stage contextually for what the real underneath the conversation is all about, which is one of the things that you talk about, one, one of your greatest quotes and sound bites is that the wrong, you don't ask if you've been sold a lie, ask if you've bought the lie, right? What a great place to interject that quote. Um, and I, the first time I heard you say that just in some YouTube sound bite, I was driving and I pulled over. I was like, oh, I literally, I just pulled over. I was like, okay, that right there, is one of the most powerful distinctions because so many people like these activists and, and again, like I'm just making general statements out there. Um, there's noble activism. You're an activist. I'm an activist. We're actively out there on whatever front lines of our particular voice and message out there exercising our, our ability to educate and teach people. We may be doing it in a different way and, and maybe it, I think it might be a more productive way because it's about self-empowerment, not about collectivism and let's all rally together and get our voices heard because we've never felt heard a day in our life. It's not coming from insecurity. It's coming from remarkable security, which, you know, these are all things I'm, I'm just kind of like, there, there's so many things here that we could go on a little bit of a tangential, but ultimately what I want to say, uh, you know, is kind of the next topic I want to transition with you. A, I want you to elaborate on that quote I mentioned in the context I want to move in with you is the process of self individuation you know, developing a healthy, the, the healthy development of the ego identity and the journey of selfhood, because, you know, like the Eckhart Tolle and the Miss, you know, a lot of it's great, like, yeah, the present moment, but the present moment is a fluid thing. So it's more actually being in the flow of life, instead of the snapshot of life and trying to hold on to that, right? There's a fluidity, it's like a river. Um, but, you know, a lot of people take this idea of the ego and identity, and they're so confused about what that means. So, you know, um, again, I, feel I, can throw, I can throw the kitchen sink at you and you'll, you'll, you'll make something great out of it. So I'll, <laughs> I'll pause on that note. But this is the way we should be thinking of it. You, you see, now these people like Eckhart Tolle and I've just borrowed a lot of nice rhetoric from greater teachers. That's all. They, they, uh, the past has created the career for them, right? Greater men than they have created a career for these uh, people. And so it's very highfalutin. And, and, and of course, people who are coming to it for the, you know, you know, but what, what's happening there is that they're offering you manuals for the inauthentic life, right? Uh, and there is no manual that is required in individualism. In fact, the very word tells you that even your path to the truth is your path to the truth. It doesn't even share anything in common. Well, no, of course it does. It shares things in common, I mean, in a loose way. But ultimately, some of the real motivations why you got started, how you walked your own road, the fact that you did walk it, the sunsets and the, the rain and the storms that you saw is all unique to you. So manuals be damned, you know, um, they have their place like any other person's teachings, but basically they're just guides, you know, and my work is always insisting upon that, that you never accept anything I'm saying, you know, doubt it, go research it, find out. And hopefully, you know, uh, try to veer away from any kind of collectivistic, you know, action, which will slowly erode your individuality. And, and also this, then this thing about sensitivity again, that sensitivity is not a verbal thing. It is, and I can, you can prove it just with, as I said, interactions with these people who keep on telling you they are the sensitive ones. They're getting their feelings hurt. Yeah. And your girth size is coming into this conversation, correct? And the big gulps and the liters of Coke in your fridge and the, the Velveeta cheese and the fluorescent lights and on and on we go. Yeah, but that is coming way. into this conversation at some point, Mr. Sensitive or Mr. Sensitive Person. Yeah, and by the way, I'm not going to, I'm just going to interject this real quick um, because I've seen it happen so many times in my field of work, which is like, you want to talk about sensitivity? Talk about the mother that just told me about her son that got vaccinated and now he can't walk. You want to talk about sensitivity? Like for you, the work that you do, the work that I do, the work that all of us do takes tremendous courage, but it's not even really courage at the end of the day because when you see what's going on, it's just a duty. What the heck else am I going to do when I've seen the atrocities and it's so blatantly clear and I've been soberized by it all. And I've seen what happens to, you know, the vaccine issue and the GMOs and all the, all the stuff going on. It's like, 
I'm not worried about hurting someone's feelings. I'm worried about what happens if I don't speak up because I've seen what, you know, like that example I gave and many, many others. It's, um, I just want to mention that because this whole sensitivity thing is totally ridiculous and, and hurting people's feelings. It's like, yeah, you know, like Joe Dispenza says in his life story, how he came to his work, you know, sometimes you need a wake up call in order to wake up. And that's part of the journey. Be grateful for it, but don't attack the messenger, you know. Yeah. When there are, when the argument is lost, you'll have a lot of attack in the messenger, you know, and, and, and spitting venom in his face once the, once the whole argument has actually been lost and, you know, that kind of thing. But, but the strange thing is that when you speak the words of truth to somebody, there's a little voice in the back of their head. Remember that resonance thing that says, I told you so. Because you're all you are is the external representative of what their own conscience has been saying. And so you have no reason to be ashamed. You have no reason to, you know, quieten yourself down. You have no reason also to get in their face. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm also, I, co- I qualify everything I'm saying by saying, for fuck's sake, don't have these conversations, please. And if you do, go like what we're doing. Do it globally. Talk to the biggest uh, demographic you can, you know, out beyond your little yard. Because yeah, doing it in your backyard is going to be problematic. So I always say, yeah, I do it through a blog, a little film, you know, a little podcasting. So I do say get out there or by all means, but don't lose your own energy over it. Don't, don't have expectations, you know, because they'll destroy you. And so a certain kind of strength that you just mentioned is a very unusual type of strength that people don't have. It's the strength of having no expectations. People are not taught that. It's the, stre- it's the strength of realizing that um, uh, it's deconstructive work. So that the power and the strength you need is utterly different than, you know, it's not left brain, it's right brain. We're trying to get out of the right of the left brain, you know, uh, clinches. And that's a very subtle kind of work. And you need to be sensitive, you know, and and reading these Khalil Gibrans and, oh, so many, many people, right, who help you with the tools to do that. And then, of course, again, the sensitization to realize that part of the assault, part of the pathogenic assault is on your body, actually on your physical body, not the mind, but the body. That takes a person could live 50 years and not even realize that. So this is a missing piece. You know, so I incorporate as much as I can in my work. Uh, and of course, there are, you know, we're not bashing people who are necessarily overweight. There's a lot of other reasons you can be overweight. I'm talking about the trending aspect of it, you know, and like, the you know, like fat, of like fat shaming. Show. Right. Yeah. Huh? This whole thing yeah, about yeah. like fat. Like I, I heard somebody say, like, in this, uh, you know, I have a nutrition company that I work with, and there was this whole promo they put out talking about like be your fittest self or whatever, you know, whatever their message was. And somebody, a millennial, by the way, just want to throw that out there said like oh you can't do that because it's fat shaming and i got i was just like i was like wow really like that had nothing but that was their interpretation so you can see how the culture has enculturated through this this false sensitivity where you can't even you can't even well you definitely can't call a spade a spade let's not even go there but you can't even suggest like you know like get fit for the summer or whatever the thing is like something that would be relatively positive and healthy or motivating. You can't even go there because then somebody who is on the opposite spectrum that doesn't want to empower themselves, doesn't want to get healthy, has no intention to better themselves. They might get offended and we can't have that. Uh, and, and, and they used to be able to get offended and there's nothing they could do about it. But now that society has normalized them and given them the power. That's why I said, but normalizing pathology. Mediocrity. Yeah. And oh, of course. And so now the pathogenic person says, hey, I'm going to call in the schizogenic society to back me up, asshole. So the words of truth are now literally poison to people's minds. They're going to accuse you of being, you know, uh, fascistic and, and uh, all sorts of, you know. They're going to, so in other words, I, th- I think I had a quote somewhere that I made up. You know, the insanity of, t- of the modern age is when you call out the insane. When you call out insanity, that is the new definition of insanity. And by God, that's what it is. So, you know, th- there you are. And this has been predicted by many, many people. Goethe in the 1700s, you know what I mean? It's not something new. Many films have Rudolf talked about Steiner, it. All- oh, my God. They all called it out that this was happening. Yeah. But what it does is it just demands more, uh, more of the white blood cells of intelligence. <laughs> you know, for us to keep that back and not engage. 
yeah, and yeah, then yeah. hone in that, okay, I still want to help the world, right, but now I'm going to do it this way. Mm. Your published mm-hmm. work, a uh, you know, set of articles, whatever, and, and you do it in a systematic, clever way. That's all yeah. I've ever asked. It's really not the end. Any intelligent person should e- easily be able to handle that, you know, like you've done with a set of all these incredible videos and talks and interviews. Mm. Right, that's what I mean. Do it in a structured, clever way, like your school teachers taught you once upon a time when it was pro- almost a little bit better schooling than we've had now. Yes. You know, to collate, to synthesize, to credit the site. Why? Not because it's egoistic to do that, because it's ethical to do that. It's because How it's did you ethical. miss that? It's the right thing yeah. to do. It's the right thing to do. It's not because I want to make money. It's not because I want to berate this other person who doesn't cite. But I will call them up and question their level of competence as a world teacher, which is in their head what they think they are. If they're not citing the masters that came before, you bet I'll get up out of my chair and ask about that. You better believe it, I will, because I don't leave those grades unattended, pal, mm, right? Mm, mm, and I want to know what you think you are, that, you know, that's not part of your, your gig. And then when your little crony friends come and blame me for needing that, they're calling you an egomaniac or whatever, it goes, no, I'm just calling, on, I, I question the ethics. You should be questioning the ethics of somebody. Uh, and the, and the, what, you're, what you're not, you're actually attacking the one who does ethically do what I'm asking you to do. What a warped world. Yeah. My God. Yeah. And if we don't, if we don't question, like a true friend is somebody who's willing to call someone out on something when they're going off, when their when their integrity is, is being swayed or they're swaying their integrity. And that's not an insult. That's the ultimate, it's the ultimate benefit to the person because we can only see what we can see and things get busy. We get confused. We go through experiences that, you know, we're going through the forest and we've never been through the forest. So we might get swayed. There might be a snake with an apple or something and we're hungry because we're exhausted and we've been through the forest and we don't know where to go. And, uh, and we might call that divine intervention or something. Um, but then someone comes and they're like, Hey, Hey, hold on, hold on. Before you eat that apple, before you give into your immediate impulses or gratify yourself, look over there, that path, that path, less, less traveled keep going on that path. Don't fall for this mirage. Don't fall for your impulses because, you know, that might take you somewhere that ultimately is not supportive in the long term. Maybe appealing shiny object syndrome may be appealing in the short term and it may gratify the discomfort that you're experiencing along the journey, but don't give up your integrity because that's all we have. And to me, that's a friend. That's a friend. I've had so many people that have disappeared or or for whatever reason, or, you know, um, and, but ultimately, again, like that, that's, that, that's just something I wanted to mention. That's something we don't see as much in our culture. And, um, and I think it has to go with like Ralph Waldo uh, Emerson, he wrote that essay on self-reliance, right? You know, can we basically the, you know, my point to this too, is that talking about the healthy development of the self ego identity has a lot to do with being able to rein, rein ourselves in too, right? Like, what if we don't have that friend? What if we don't have someone to support us when the adversarial force of temptation arises? Then can we rely on ourselves? And that's that's something I think is worth mentioning too, um, because I don't I don't see that a lot, Michael. Um, I just it's a rare it's like that samurai quality that you mentioned, like the psychological immunity. I don't see that as much being a common thing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think that uh, what's happening now is that people are so extrovert, their egos have welded themselves to the public, you know, world and the, and the will of the crowd that certainly that is one's way of hiding out and silencing that voice. But the thing is that whenever you go against nature, nature comes back with a vengeance. And in psychological terms, that means that voice, which you suppress and don't listen to comes back in daemonic form probably not the perfect word, but, you know, daemonic, D-A-I or D-A-E, monic. It, it, it has multiple re- meanings, but it really means coming back in a sort of a um, hostile, right, way. And it's for the simple reason you've been chucking junk over into its garden for, for all of your life. And you've been building your wall higher and higher and higher so that you don't have to hear its symphony. Well, this thing is, is a very, it can turn into a, a, quite a frightening thing to your lie, right? And in recent work, we've also shown that that's the reason for the rise of the cult of of prosperity and the law of attraction and all that, because knowing that that voice is getting louder and a panzer tank is about to crash through your freaking lie, you suddenly try to develop manuals for the inauthentic life to help to keep it even further out. 
But every time you try to suppress it, you know, the greatest psychologist showed the psychodynamics is it's coming through anyway, right? Like grass moving, you know, growing through the cement. And that is the fact. So to answer your question, when you deny reality to this extent, suffer and probably perish. But truth will go on. I've also called, you know, in my work, I've always called truth the most destructive thing that anyone could ever know. The most corrosive thing is truth. It will, it will get into your life. It, it will decimate your lie and it will sanitize your mind, whether you like it or not. Or you'll break in the process. But that is a form of sanitization because then you, you fall into <laughs> yeah. the abyss. You're no longer a problem. Go and be insane then. Yeah. As most people are choosing. The thing is that, you know, because freedom underlies all of these things in people, freedom is the basic. It's the mark of spirit. You know that, the, you know that spirit must be good because only a good force, only a good spirit would, would give to you, impart to you something that allows you to flaunt spirit's own ordinances. How can that be a tyrant? Mm -hmm. The spirit is so generous to you, it offers you even the chance, the freedom to go against it, to, to, to right. ignore it. And to, and to violate it, its laws. If that isn't, right, if that isn't something extraordinary to contemplate. Yes, yes. And, and of course it is, because from that comes all the evil in the world. You're free to be evil. You're free to be immoral. Hey, you're free to be amoral, mm -hmm. right? You're free to go and, and be self-destructive yeah. because the, the, the creator that made you has given you of its own essence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the sage and the vocational man sees it as it should be seen, which is, then what have I just learned about the DNA of my creator? If he should leave, give me ultimate freedom, then I worship that. I bow to that. Right, right. I know that, I know that the heart of the universe is good. Mm -hmm. Just from this analysis, if freedom is indeed the basis of all consciousness and all life, then, because it, be it could be anything else, couldn't it? It could be unfreedom. Try that on for fucking size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where you're duty bound, in everything you're doing. We have people out there who believe that that's the way shit should be. But you see, it's not. It's the fragrance of absolute freedom to grow or to devolve, you know, to evolve or devolve, de to move left, to move right, to stay perfectly still yeah. and be a fossil. But the very, if you really deeply contemplate, like Schelling did, like Kant did, right? You, and Hegel, you understand that, my goodness, what more do I need to know about the heart of my creator? Then that he imparted, and, and what he imparted to me isn't secondary to his nature. It is the core nature within spirit itself that then is imparted to me. So we're one. Now I have a tangible, not faith based. Forget all that. There's no faith involved in what I'm saying. It's mm. absolute knowledge. When Carl Jung was asked, Do you believe in you know, a higher force or a God or what? He says, I don't believe. I know. Yes. This is what I'm talking about. So, you know, back in Ireland, you know, the Protestant uh, grand, grannies and uncles and aunts, you know, Michael, Michael, you know, do you, are you a Christian? You know, mm. back in our teenagers, we used to get this one all the time, especially if you're kind of wearing Slayer t-shirts and leather jackets, you might, you know, and your hair's down over your face. There's a good tendency that they might hit you with a question like that. Do you go to church? Are you a Christian? Uh, do you believe in God? And I would always say no. And you should have seen the China cups <laughs> and the meltdown. What? You know, these are total Presbyterians. I mean, you've got the equivalent in America, of course, but over in Ireland, it's something even more extreme. And I go, no, no, I don't believe in anything to do with God. I know. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Right? Yes. That's the end of that conversation then, right? Yeah. Because they are creatures of belief, and that's fine to a point. Mm -hmm. But the, the vocational man has seen the truth as the truth, and he goes, look, all the other structures are man-made. Yep. But e if, if, if the greatest evil is still based in freedom, I want to know what is this freedom. Mm. I want to smell it out. F tell me what freedom is, folks. Yeah. And suddenly, suddenly, you find out you're an eagle amongst chickens. If you ask the right question, you'll find out you are an outsider because nobody can answer it. Yeah, right. And then you go on your journey. Then you say, sorry, folks, I asked you these questions. You couldn't answer it. Now I must go on the Siddhartha Road to find the te the, wherever that teaching may be, I need to follow it because you haven't answered me, world. Right? And that then is your, uh, that's your out. That's you now donning a different robe, right? That's you moving out and becoming an outsider. And yet the beauty of it is you can do it in a crowd. But you are, you're sacrosanct. Your mind is, is attitudinally free. 
what the others do or don't do has ceased to be important because you have a vocation, right? Because you sense now the voice of the creator, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not in some ludicrous way, right? But you sense the absolute, it's almost like the, the essence of essences in a way, right? Or at least it'll, it'll, put you, it'll put you on the road, you know, in a way that very few people ever experience uh, in order to find out what is freedom. Mm -hmm. you know uh, and, and also then that will it will be difficult because then you have to learn what unfreedom is remember it's all deconstructive right so you find out what a thing is by the painstaking there we go there's the word we're looking for yes. the painstaking elimination of the untrue mm -hmm. only when the false is seen as false does truth stand as it is now you will not find any millions of people signing on for this you Eckhart Tolle no problem but you'll never find but one in many millions, you see, who's moved from this. And their journey then is a very idiosyncratic one, you know, that takes them into heavens and hells and, and everything in between. Mm, all this contrast. You know, there's, there's um, and please let me know, I know it's late where you're at and you're so gracious for, for really extending the time. Um, there's a couple kind of themes and they're kind of interwoven, but they have to be addressed because we're just in such a perfect kind of um, yeah, synchronistic right. fluid uh, fluid flow and by the way the word synchronicity or serendipity is very important to what you're talking about because it's through the phenomenology of experiencing synchronicities like today i had one that that kind of reconciled an itch that i had from my past that sometimes we think like oh you know we move on with our life you know a relationship or something and there's collateral damage or there's fragments of in, unintegrated um, psychic material. And we're just like, oh, I'm experiencing a new life. I'm dating a new person. I'm doing my thing and I've moved on. But then you revisit a place, especially in a physical place, um, and things come up and you realize like, wow, okay, there's stuff there. And I had an interesting synchronicity that literally integrated a soul fracture or something like not totally intense but i've had that experience through the reflective nature of a situation that i didn't predict i didn't plan i was just in my flow abiding by my own intuition saying go here do this and synchronicity is like you know my friend david wolf says that synchronicity is my religion you know it's basically it's experiential right it's like that's the one way i know that god is real because there's certain things that line up so perfectly that it cannot be explained and it cannot be predicted and it could only be by the grace of something beyond. And so um, I'm curious what your, your thoughts on, because there's so many topics around, so many things have been discussed around synchronicity and what that means. But I'm curious, like, if you have any personal, I'm, I'm sure you have plenty of experiences, but I'm curious what your, your perspective on synchronicity is. Well, I think that uh, the, the instances you're talking about are instances. What I've discovered is that synchronicity is happening all the time. The mm -hmm. whole thing mm -hmm. is synchronous. It's just that when our left brain attention, when one just happens to leap out more, you're aware of it, right? Yeah, yeah. We're always in amongst all the synchronicity. The whole thing is a synchronic phenomenon. The whole thing. The whole thing. And it's just about you looking up from you know, the ground or it coming to knock you on the head, you know, uh, when you really notice those ones that everybody, you know, is able to sort of cite right. in a way. Yeah. So I think that when I talked about the enhanced sensitivity, that what you're talking about now comes into play because the enhanced sensitivity will make it a daily, even minute by minute. Can you believe this, right? When you, it's not moments of synchronicity, it is a perpetual flow of it. Yeah. Right? yeah. Just like, what the hell? That's wonder. That's, that's awe and it's gratitude, right? So it's like uh, I said in a recent podcast that, um, again, speaking more about how Jung would probably have phrased it. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, even this brings in a sort of being near to nature and all of these things. But what I really mean is that when you clear the mind of the scrap heap of all the nonsense, and this can mean fasting, this can mean changing your lifestyle, being close to nature, yeah, yeah, for periods of time or even for longer periods. Yeah. But what you're really doing is the moment that you clear the mind out, you're making room for these uh, angelic forces, the archetypes to come forth. They're not going to come forth on the dung heap of your fucking mind. Right? <laughs> so the purification or the uh, sanitization, sanity yes. and sanitize are connected for a reason. Cleaning. Okay? Yeah. 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 So you can't force those angels in. They're the hooded ones and they're there, but you, you can't hear them because they're speaking so quietly. 
and they can't come close to you, right? But when you light the fire and you say it's purged and you just sit there and waiting or what Heidegger calls dwelling, you just, there's no effort, there's no interpretation, there's no calling even. The work is, the work is to clean yourself out. And that means somatically and psychologically from the influences. Well, that requires introspection. Yeah, we're really in an introspective community or world, aren't we? No, we're not. But if you start doing these things, it's not a for, forced, nothing's forced. Nothing's yeah. by the manual. It's just a simple process that the mind can do itself. You know, like a self-cleaning machine, right? Absolutely, right. Right. We know how to do that. But yeah, it helps if you go out into nature, right? Uh, uh, the, the, in fact, that's part of it. That, in fact, that's one of the cleansing things that you do. But once you do it, when you want a description of why this is important, is because now the voices of your inner family, your inner guides, right, that are opening these portals, like Blake said, opening the doors of perception, right, come closer and now you're in perpetual dialogue. And that is the ultimate synchronicity because now you're going to be transformed on all levels, spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical. All these other paths, they teach you one or two, and that's about it. Yeah. You, the real magic is when you're able to be affected like it is when you're listening to good music yeah. on all levels at once and you can handle it. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's, that's, those are the, those are the four quadrants, right? The four great, that's why they say there's four archangels, right? Well, yeah, the mm. Christian religion, you know, in a, in a gross way, but the, there's a, there's a concept here, right? Those, there's, a, you know, four voices, then there's eight, then there's 16, right? Yeah. Have you been learning from that inner family? Or are you some socialist bozo at the front of the class? Well, let me guess. Take a wild guess which one it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, your mind's going to be twisted. Of course, your emotions are going to be not sensitized, but um, made neurotic. Neuro ways that I neurosis. Yeah. Yeah. Keyword. Neurosis is the key. Yeah. What they call, when they say to you, I'm very sensitive. No, you're fucking neurotic. And we need to know the oh, language. Right. When you stick mics into these people's faces, yeah. don't let them win the point. You go, well, that's a, that's a kind of a neurotic statement, isn't it? Are you, you know, have you ever had any mental problems? That's the end of that conversation. You've just, you've just beat that little freak in the street and they're fucking off because you hit them with a psychological term. And you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. Because they are obsessive compulsive. They are control freaks. Yeah. They are neurotics and psychotics and schizogenics and schizophrenics. And more, and more I get out in there, paranoics, right? They are those things. Well, why haven't you got those words in your lexicon? You damn well need to. Otherwise, they're going to win the point. This little oik is going to win the punk, the social justice war with half a brain. Yeah. I've seen worms with greater intelligence, and they're going to win over you because you have come in without the tools of the trade. Mm -hmm. You lose. Remember I said the strengths? One of the strengths, and I've said it from day one, articulation, eloquence, yes. Yes. mastery of the facts. Mm. Make a point in your heart that you'll never lose a fucking argument to one of these oiks. That's a strength. They're going to win otherwise. Do you want that? Yeah. Look like a fool? And we see, we see where the directionality of the world leads from there. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah, this, this neurosis thing, I want to just kind of touch on this for a second here because this is something that I became very, very um, acutely aware of when I got into the diet world and particularly when I – had my own transformation with raw food. We talked about that on your podcast when you had me on, like getting into raw food, vegetarianism and veganism. And, um, and I believe in the ethics and the philosophy and kind of the, the spiritual ethos of those paths in their most kind of nobleized um, realm, but just the same as the, the activism, social justice warrior, all that kind of energy. You know, you better believe the animal rights activism and the vegan activism again like for everyone listening i'm just making a distinction psychologically speaking and anyone by the way anyone listening because i know a lot of you know what i'm talking about and you've listened to me for long enough this is running rampant and um so anyways my experience was that like you know this basically sums it up is that like there's nothing wrong with veganism but there's a lot of things wrong with a lot of vegans and that's something that became very aware to me which is that a lot of people are using all kinds of things, but in the diet world, they're using veganism or paleo or whatever the flavor is as a way to weaponize their unreconciled anger and issues and their own insecurities and then projectile those out into the world, as you said, as a neurotic control mechanism instead of integrating in themselves, like this is the path I choose, this is the particular dietary philosophy that resonates with me, and I also realize not only do I have no right, but I have no need or desire to impose 
my, of all things, dietary belief system onto someone else because I've also seen where it doesn't work and does work for a vast amount of people at different stages in their own unique life journey. So I have all that I'm working with, but obviously someone who's neurotic is only kind of is cognitively biased in their own emotionality. And, and I just like that neurotic thing is like, it was very kind of traumatic for me when I got into this. It made me question, eh, I don't know, it, is this just the diet world? And then I realized it's actually every field. So no matter what I got into, I would have to come up against this. So I was like, okay, well, I might as well plant my flag here because this seems to be the most important thing for me. And I'll just deal with whatever backlash comes. Yeah, you'll always have it. And I do want to address, like, I need to get a jacket. It's kind of cold. Can I get it for yeah, one? For, just give me one. Just give me one. Yeah, so Michael's going to go get a jacket. It's, it's late where he's at. He has graciously um, allotted the time. It's probably well past midnight for him, maybe even one in the morning. So just want to make that um, people aware of that. And we're going to keep going a little bit longer. So, uh, yeah, I'm basically just talking in, the, in the, the gap. Hope you guys are enjoying this, by the way. We're going deep. Okay. Yeah, good man. Thank you for that. Um, oh, do you, do you realize, I, I'm talking about synchronicity. This is exactly what I've been thinking about for <laughs> all this year through, actually. The way I would answer it is, is like this, right? On the surface, a lot of things look like a virtue, but you can be very, very uh, fooled. You know, uh, and, and I also agree with this, uh, this uh, aspect that you said, maybe should we deal with that first, you see, is this fanaticism that creeps in when somebody thinks that they found a piece of the light themselves, they now turn into tyrants. You know, the guy that made me a vegetarian, who at the time was a family friend, he, he was standing right beside my fridge. I was 15, I think cooking a couple of burgers with the blood dripping right out of them. And he goes, I don't think you need that. I started being a vegetarian for that day and I'm still here today. His sum total, because I trusted him and his energy and he was, you know, he was right where he needed to be. And he didn't give a monkey's ass whether I changed my dietary habits or not. He just said, I don't think, you know, I quote him directly. He said, I don't think you need that. And I knew exactly what he meant. And I said, that's the last meat I'll ever eat. Right. But then coming back to this point, and it is good to use the concept of diet because let me see, there was a couple of, there was a, I think it was a person that I knew, right, who was going through a transition, who was very, very into veganism and, 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 and like almost like you could tell it was neurotic. Right. And then they became a born again Christian. So I had ample opportunity to observe what the, the hell is going on here, right? Those two things are tied together. I've noticed this, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. Jesus, I thought I was alone in this one and I, it, it bugged me, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't dialogue with this person about it. It's not my place, right? But I did observe it in my own way, right? And I thought, there's something really inauthentic about this whole carrot eating thing and this raw broccoli stuff. It just didn't have the ring of authentic. Cause I, like I told you, I've been a vegetarian since 1982. Wow. And I've seen it all when wow. it comes to that, right? The authentic and the inauthentic. So, uh, so the, here's this person, you know, uh, and, uh, and they, they're going through all of this and they, they change every, all of their lifestyle, all of their beliefs in, you know, the new age movement or conspiracy or true thing or whatever you want to call it. I would say deeper researches. That's all was thrown out by this person, and they became born again Christians, right? And start immediately following some very, very fundamentalistic uh, uh, teaching teachings, you know, and and were, was extremely uh, lost. And then something in my mind said, "Then why are they still advocating all of this stuff about fasting and raw food and mm -hmm. uh, and all of the like?" Yes. I'm really into that. I think it's a great subject. But what the hell is going on? It has a ring of inauthenticity. And the only thing I could come up with was this. And that is that they're spiritually impure on a very, very deep level. But the spiritual darkness in, the, in that person is so deep, nothing on earth can ever fix it or change it or take it away. 
And then that will account for why on one level they went to Jesus. He's got the detergent you need or think so. And then you went over to clean the body. Right? Mm -hmm. And in India, there's a statement that uh, there was a, a uh, it happened to be a master who was walking, you know, at these, at these ritual sites like the Ganges where everybody's cleaning themselves in the water and doing these holy rituals, right? Mm -hmm. And this guy jumps into the river Ganges with a suitcase and, and uh, frenetically uh, scrubs the outside of the suitcase. And all these holy men are all going, he's a fucking nutter, what's up? And he, and he goes, well, I'm cleaning my laundry, don't you know? And they went, cleaning the laundry, brother? That is inside the suitcase. He goes, yes, but isn't your karma? You're jumping in the water to clean your karma and all it's doing is scrubbing your body over and over again? He goes, I'm taking a page out of your book. And then I thought about that and I said, isn't that what this person is doing? They think that by cleaning physical dirt out, but these extraordinarily convoluted, you know, it's so enforced, it's so obsessive compulsive, it's so master slave on the body. Right. You're dirty. You're dirty. I'm going to eat only carrots. Right. I'm only going to drink green you know, tea, right? right yeah, yeah. And miso and all of this thing. And all of that's cool. But the thing is, you have got it in a fanatical way. So it's almost like... Well, it's masochistic versus self-loving, yeah. right? Isn't right. that the distinction that we're making? Like, I think so. Is yeah. my, my message, especially because I, I experienced both of these, and now that I've integrated... My message to people is I'm not concerned about what you do or don't do. I'm concerned about how you feel about yourself because who you're being will significantly potentize or amplify what you do. But we're so obsessed about doing, doing to become. Why don't we focus on equilibrating our, our self, the hemispheres or whatever, and getting right with ourself and how we feel about ourself. And then the dietary path is a tool. You know, it's like, you know, Gabriel Cousins, if you're familiar with him, he says that you can't eat your way to God. Now, you can eat in a way that helps you gain access to the God force, but to make food or anything else a religion, like what you're talking about is basically superficiality, right? Like, I don't love myself. I basically am I'm fighting myself. I have a psychological autoimmune condition, and I'm going to cover that up with the food thing, but my soul is desperately yearning for something, so I'm going to make it this. But I'm going to do the cleansing, but I'm not going to do the emotional work that is part and parcel to, hmm. you know, to, to authentic healing. Because, you know, food doesn't heal you. It supports you in your body's healing process. But, you know, obviously, you have to do the emotional work and the psychological sanity work. I love that term. Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. But if you can't do it because, say, you're so spiritually diseased, and if you haven't, you know, people haven't noticed there are some spiritually diseased people around, Take it as a given. Trust me. Well, the thing is that then that person is, you have to not get into their mind and see what a desperate, desperate predicament they're in, like a golem sitting under the mountain talking to himself in the dark, right? That soul is poisoned. And actually, the person I was just describing to you was evil. Make of that what you want, right? They were evil. And so this evil person, in the depth of her, of her being, knew that she was evil. Well, I, she doesn't need anybody else around her. She's in a turmoil of such unimaginable fury inside, despite the, the shell, what the shell looks like or whatever, right? So then I start to see the psychology of this. And that is that the, as you say, the, uh, the, 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 the pathology started to scrub. You know the way these, you know the way these ob uh, obsessive compulsives will get out a toothbrush? and start scrubbing the carpet and cleaning little stains and shit like that. Right? All we're talking about here is total fact. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this person was doing. They were picking the scab. They were pruning. They were, they were primping. They were, and yeah. so they turned, they turned to a legitimate, healthy subject. Mm -hmm. Who knows why? That's the whole story, right? Found a book on the spinner rack, heard somebody else, watched a video, and said, that's what I need to do. And just like that toothbrush scrubbing or like the suitcase being polished from the outside, thinking they're going to clean their dirty laundry by doing no holistic spiritual work. And then turning to the socialized, a stamp of approval, you know, proved detergent method of, of the, the sinner goes to, right? It's Christian. It's that kind of Christianity. Not, it's not, they're signing on for that because it's the authenticated, socialized, collectivized means of being pure where all my sins will be forgiven. Nonsense, right? Yeah. What do you think this Jesus is to you then? He's just a transactional he's, figure. He's, yeah. 
A dial-up doctor? <laughs> right. Dial-up rotor router? Well, uh, believe me, that's what they're doing because they've, they've lived pornographic and, and, and disgusting, immoral lives. And then it's just like, where's that number? When I've satiated every pore of my body, it's like a picture of Dorian Gray. The thing is oozing with pus. This is what you've done to your soul. Oof. Whether you've had enlighteners in your life or people who try to stop you, people who, who, who crawled on their knees begging you to change your ways, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who put their own souls on the line to, to sanitize you and beg you not to, to lose your soul, but they were kicked in the teeth. Mm. Right? So you've done this to yourself. Right. Then you go and sign on for some car wash and, and some, and then to, and, cause you're so irritated. It's like the, you know, the, the, the uh, what do you call it? The, um, well, it's the opposite. The oyster has a, has a uh, grain of sand that it makes a beautiful pearl. No, these people have an irritant side. They don't turn into a pearl. It, it's turns into weeds. Yeah. It's just, you're yeah. poisoning your being, but you did it to yourself. Right. Aren't those people then now we're talking about individuals here. Can't that also happen to society or a little subculture first? Right. And then they all join it because being poisoned spiritually, they think in terms of the lower grade of, of healing and cleanliness. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. You trust your feelings with those people and try to observe their, you know, and if you pick up something that's not right, then, you know, you'll know, you'll know, you'll have your protection. Mm. So many, so many incredible points, Michael. And there's so much that can be further elaborated and extrapolated on. I mean, that this is this is the most important type of conversation for you know one of the things i talk about is that the content of a topic is informed by the context and what we're doing is we're contextualizing a lot of this you know when i think about you know you say the spinner rack or more of the cosmetic um you know self-help or personal development stuff there's value based on where people are at now is it ultimate value is it is it you know, the complete picture? No. You know, when I think of the law of attraction, well, I think of two things. I know a lot of the guys in that I know Michael Beckwith. I've known him for years. He's one of my personal spiritual mentors. I've, I've collaborated with him. I went to Egypt with him for two weeks. I know the dude and he is like full on. John Martini, John Asraf. I know a lot of these guys and they're the real deal. And when I talk to them about their opinions on the secret, they were like, I'm grateful for the exposure. However, there was a massive amount that we contributed that never even made it into the secret. So the context got, you know, I'm not here to say it's good or bad, but what I am here to say is that the law of attraction sounds a lot like the law of magnetism from a hermetic perspective, but the context can, can derive a completely different interpretation and, and uh, you know. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Not to mention that the fact that there's a lot of Gnosticism, right, involved yeah. in the background of a lot of these, including in religion, uh, they played that down, right? The Gnostic origins of Christianity have been massively played down. Uh, I'm, I'm an anti-Gnostic. Uh, you know, I'd be a hermeticist because hermeticism and Gnosticism are diametrically opposed. And some of the names I've thrown out there, like William Blake, another, and Carl Jung, uh, they've been mistakenly thought of as Gnostics. It's because the Gnostic cult has tried to... Uh, co-opt their work in an act of a massive disingenuousness. But as a matter of fact, you know, hermeticism is more important. And hermeticism, of course, doesn't think of the earth or the world as anything evil. You've seen these Leonardo da Vinci pictures of man spread out like a pentagram. Yeah. And the pentagram is the phi ratio, the way leaves grow, the way the earth is, it's the number of the earth. So if, if somebody's pointing out that man is that, then they're hermeticists, that the earth and man are one. The Gnostic is we're caught in the cage of the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah with our victim we're just victims we're just broken victims I just deal with it or <laughs> that we're ruled over by these archons yeah you are it's That's called it. yourself right yeah there's an archon all right he's you know he's not up there he's right in here in your heart the way you see the world uh, uh maya mm -hmm. i've put this into so many works right the alvin boyd kuhn's description of maya illusion is the illusion by which you see the world. The fact that you think the world is lower is the Maya, not that the world is lower. Oh, it's a percent. Download oh that. Oh Download that. Sweet. There's freedom. Did you feel some shackles coming off? Did you feel your spine clicking into place? My, my, my false oh. perception is the yes. Maya, not the perceived. The perception heals the healer. Like this is, this is the... You know, I've, I've heard so many people say it in certain ways. John Martini has a thing about it. Michael has a thing about it. They talk about the fact that you, you, you're healed when you equilibrate your perception. 
if your perception is even or it's off balance, you're infatuated, being high or you're low, you're in the, the victim state, either way, you're not perceiving reality correctly. And it has a physical, a physiological repercussion. And the healing of the body can also be related to the healing of our perspective or our perception. They're interrelated. And massively so. I'm a huge believer in that. Perception is everything. And we could talk for hours about that. Yeah. Well, all I'll say is this, that Wow, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that one's really, really huge. It is really huge. Uh, I often talk, talk, talk about it as being way of seeing, right? Now, it's like, it's like you do need to. It's just, it's huge. It's, I mean, where do you go with this, right? Perception. Yeah, I, I don't even know where to go with it. I mean, that is so vast, right? It's just so vast. Yeah. But well, yeah, it, it, yeah. Well, maybe it could be distilled into its its core principles as just self integration, right? Not well, being compartmentalized. Okay, the way I would I would phrase it, thinking of the man that you've spoken of, is like yeah. Oh, and also we said hermeticism. Let's add a, a cousin to that, stoicism. Uh oh yeah, right? be beautiful. Yes, right. yes. Let's go there, right? In brief, one's relation to the world can be very emphatic. Right, like we said, overly overkill, yeah. Uh, uh, or it could be disinterested in a cold, emotionless, dead way. Yeah, yeah. No, stoicism in the middle is knowing your limitations. What I can change, and then when I find out what it is, I cannot change. I don't lose any sleep over it. Yeah. Put it another way, in terms of prosperity, think. I love luxuries just like the next man, but if I don't have them in my life, it doesn't bother me one fucking bit. Absolutely. Right. I can ride bareback or I can rear on a thousand dollar saddle. I'm, I'm, I'm the same both ways. Yeah. And I'm, I'm unchanged right. by my circumstances. Yeah. It doesn't, I can ride a donkey. Me. If you bring right. me a donkey or a racehorse, it's good to me. They're beautiful animals. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm right here where I need to be. Right. Mm. Sto and stoicism also is, it is a kind of detachment. Let's not, let's not doubt that, yeah. but it's the detachment. That's a very alive, active participation. It's not the stone cold dude, right. With a heart of ice which is sometimes a lot of way that, you know, sto stoicism is presented. Stoicism is very intellectual. It's very discriminating. It's very judgmental. But it, it is realizing that you have a certain impact on the situation, and then there's one on which you have no impact. And it's the discernment to know, is the meter on green or red? You take it out and you go, red, I, I, there's nothing I can do can change this person like this creature I was telling you about a minute ago. Right. Uh, and then it's going green. Hey, no, there's something you can advise here or a book that you can hand this person, right? Like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but stoicism with hermeticism is a, lo is a respectful way to know where your boundaries are, what your limitations are. And believe me, we have those limitations, right? And also then it's a kind of sensitization because in order to know what to do in each of these situations, you must have that sensitivity. Is this person worth, you know, laying my soul out in a red carpet for them? Is this person, you know, worth it, right? Uh, or is it better just to s pull back my energies right now and see what happens when I'm not forcing the issue or giving it out or exhausting my energy running around, you know, doing right. things. So, but right. you're quite right. It's that balance, right? And that is attainable only by a stoical mind. And until somebody's really up to speed on what that actually means and entails, you know, uh, it's like, it's like calibration. If I feel, if I feel my body now has enough food to eat, I stop. Right. I don't keep on piling in and feel bloated for the rest of the, the day and the night, do I? You know, you, you're talking about stoicism, and this is, this is leading into the last, the last topic that I really want to, I want to like finale with you because, you, you know, I feel like this is going to be a really big conclusion. But, you know, I, I read that, that book by Seneca, who's probably one of the most famous, aside from Marcus Aurelius, voices for, for stoicism. He said, one of the quotes that when I opened that book like four or five years ago, it knocked me on my butt. He said, you act mortal in all that you fear and immortal in all that you desire. In other words, you have no concept of your own mortality because in everything that you fear, you act mortal. Oh, the taxes, I'm being audited. Oh, the relate, whatever the, the fear response is, I'm going to get to it. But the things that we actually desire, our destiny, we, oh, we'll put that off because we're going to live forever, right? So we don't need to get to that, right? Um, sympathetic, parasympathetic, not being in the autonomic balance, but being driven by our 
our fears, our worries, concerns, all that stuff. Um, I, that, that quote, and the deeper I went into that, was so powerful. And it really relates to our, our relationship with time, our relationship with our own finite incarnation. And what I want to, um, this is what I want to ask you about, which is really about life and the value of life and the value of making the most of our life. And I'll sum it up this way, which is I want to discuss your perspective on the soul and in particularly the process of the soul becoming fully incarnated and embodied within the full functionality of the human being. What I mean by that, just so I simplify that, is that what I'm getting at is that my perspective that I've started entertaining is that one cannot be a fully functional human being if they're only partially incarnated, meaning their soul hasn't fully inhabited or embodied their physical body. It's blocked. They got programs. They're running. They're not. They're in the personality to whatever. The, whatever the deal is, they're they're gunked up with chemicals. Whatever it is, the soul has not fully inhabited, and it's not really running the show per se. So they can't really be truly a fully functional human being. And I think that is part of the 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 gap or disconnect between our own sense of mortality and the aversion of even talking about the fact that. You're not going to be here in this physical body forever. So um, that, that I wanted to make sure that I put that on the table. It's, it's, it is so important. And the thing to realize is that because um, I'm a personalist, right? It's a whole philosophy. Wrote a book on it. And it kicks off with what you just said. And that is unless you really understand that the soul is yours, it doesn't even start. When you say words that have a very heavy metaphysical aura around them, like spirit, soul, God, all the rest of it, Geist, it's all very big, isn't it? We went into this in Path of the Fool. It's all out of reach. It's all august, and you hear trumpets and organs and Bach symphonies, right? It's abstract, right? It's a very small thing. It's a little light. It's a little candlelight, and it belongs to you. It is the only thing that belongs to you. This is what we call soul, S-O-L. I don't care how you spell it, right? right. There's a million giving, ways. We give our soul away. Right. How do we, how all the ways we give But it. through our thinking, through our thinking, right? Collect, it's collect, we have, everyone's got a soul. Fuck everyone. I want to know about you. Do you know you own this thing? Now, the strange, and then when you really unpack that, you find out that the body is the incarnated version of that thing you own. And boy, does it, do you own it. But do you care for it? Right? So this nutter that I was telling you about was doing all the right things according to the manual of the inauthentic life, but it rang inauthentic. And it was done as an as a, as, as a, uh, uncaring thing. Right? It, was, it was done in a very functionalized, despiritualized way. The same procedure could be done by somebody who's in total state of care. You know, how you relate to your body, how you think of it, how you... Uh, uh, sweat out all the self-hate from your parasympathetics. Right? You've got to, you have meridians, you have cells, you have marrow. Do you realize the pain and anger and torture from the adultism of your childhood, all the other upsets of the girlfriend, boyfriend, the, the beatings in school, the teachers, uh, all the shame that you've been feeling? It's all there. It's not in the mind. Let's get that real clear. It's not in the mind. What you have in the mind is a completely abstract mem memory of it which is a way to live it. You live in that Apollonian state because the reality of it in your marrow, you can't f face. So soul is purification. Is the, the, the next thing I'd say is that it's the care of the soul means the purification of your system, of all debris, all uh, detritus. You see all the flotsam and jetsam of the worldly existence. You must, your work, the great work is to purify. That's what I say is the shadow work, the holy work. Jesus, there's so many people have ludicrous interpretations of that. The shadow is anything that's cast in the shadow. Well, guess what's been cast in the shadow? This, this tangible thing right here. And so whether you want to do it this way or you want to do it that way, you know, that I leave you to, you know, fasting. Whatever. All of those things are self-discovery. Nobody can write a manual. They can guide you, you know, along. But how you actually synthesize it all is very much yourself. It's no good eating all the best food when you're not even aware of the fluorescence, the mercury, the noise of your house, the refrigerators, the high ELF waves, you know, let's get into it, right? 
So, you know, you say, oh, well, I, I do this, I do this, I, I avoid all of that. Yeah, but you're not avoiding all of these other things. So this now takes you on a journey. It's incredibly comprehensive. What about those sounds of the city? Don't you think that they entrain your mind? The buzzes, the hums of the electromagnetism around you? Do you really want it? Are you grounded? Are your feet on the ground? I bet you they're not. You say, we're going to go in. We're going to shake you down. Right? This is real martial arts. This is the real Aikido. So somebody goes, well, I do all this. Yeah, but that's A, B, and C. What about C, D, and E? And then the whole, the rest of it. It's a monumental task to come into that equilibrium that you're talking about. But the main point is that you'll never inherit soul unless you know it's yours. And you absolutely treat it like it is yours in the most precious way. Not something in the attic or the dungeon, but right with you, with whom with you have a direct conversation. You let it speak as much as it will let you speak, and you move from that point on. And you keep it private. That's why it's personalism, right? Mm -hmm. And then it will guide you and tell you how to navigate, right? Through the rocks. Through, you know, otherwise, you crash and that's it. You're dead. The first, the first rock comes up and you're, you're, you're done. So the soul is a guide. Call it the archetypes, whatever, right? But unless you personalized it, unless you know that it is yours, and it's like, a, it's like clay that you've been given at the beginning of your life, you know, the spirit is waiting for you to see, to create a masterpiece with it. If you come back with the same hunk of, of stuff they gave you at the end, they're going to go, what the hell were you alive for? Well, it's uh, modern art. Then I got to fall for that. Mm -hmm. You're given that sculpture, right? The self must be, it, the, the soul is not one thing. You see, it's a canvas, a black, blank canvas on which you're meant to create mm -hmm. yourself, the image of yourself. Mm -hmm. And you've been given, as we said in the beginning, total freedom to produce a work of great art or some slop. You have the freedom to do that, but there will be consequences later on, you know, to that. And, and one could unpack that even further, but it, it definitely includes the soma as well as the psyche. And when it comes to the despicable experiences that you've had that you've, you know, we've embodied. Yeah. Because we, as children, we didn't know what to do, right? So to, you have to do the sanitizing process of unleashing and releasing uh, all of that from your, not just your mind, but from your body. Yes. And that kind of purity then allows other forces to come and guide you and direct you. Mm -hmm. That's the real holy work. And that's the real shadow work, actually. I love, I love how you articulate and contextualize this process. And as you were talking, I was thinking of, um, you know, Jordan Peterson is a great contemporary modern time kind of speaker of archetypes and these phenomenons, especially with the onset of hyper-rationalism and atheistic, which is hilariously, it's, it's a religion. But, you know, <laughs> you know, without going into that, like the, I've seen him have these debates. And what's interesting watching it is that there is this archetypal um, existential transcendent necessity, kind of like when Nietzsche, you know, he, he mentioned the quote, you know, when, when Frederick Nietzsche said that God is dead and we had killed him. Um, I, had, I had dug deeper into that, what that really meant. And I'm seeing it play out in our time. And um, anyways, like one of the things that he mentioned that just came up in my, my mind as you were talking is that, and we're talking about the power of having choice and not just realizing that we have the choice, but the courage to make the correct choice time and time and time again, the moral choice, the unpopular choice, the, the choice that the leader makes. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, th this whole thing around nice guys, you know, it's like, it, somebody that is, that is like, quote unquote, a nice guy or somebody that doesn't have strength is not virtuous. He has no other option other than to be nice. It's actually the person that has capability to be destructive, to be violent, that has great power, but chooses to use it in a noble or, or positive way to paraphrase is somebody who's actually virtuous because he's making a choice what to do with the power. If somebody is weak or disempowered or a victim, that doesn't make them virtuous, right? They don't have another choice. They have to be subservient because they haven't developed the potential to do right or wrong. They're just kind of like, you know, in the flow. They don't have it. They're, 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 they're kind of eating from the scraps of the table, so to speak. Um, but with, and that's kind of the social activism thing. I don't want to go on a whole rant, but that's kind of like, for me, that ties it in because a lot of these characters that we think are operating with virtue, and you mentioned this virtue can, can be kind of deceiving, they're not really virtuous. They don't have any other choice. They don't have a whole lot of options because they haven't developed that inner fortitude or that courage um, to make a virtuous choice, even though, you know, maybe they can make a more convenient choice or self-serving or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. See, and again, without, without introspection, you can't have the courage to make the choice. 
because th you do have choice. That's neutral. That's the, that's the ontological state of man. But then you need the will to, to, when you've chosen to carry it out. And so that's bioenergy. So again, we're back to the body again. And, and how, you know, if you don't, because you can make all the choices you want, but the stone and the shoe is going to stop you getting to the garden gate, let alone crossing the bloody mountain. Yeah, and there's a whole path to the choices you make. You don't just make a choice. I see people all the time like, yeah, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this coaching program. I'm going to do this That's diet. Right. The next day, they're nowhere to be found. So you That's didn't right. make a choice. You just yeah. answered a whim in the moment. Yeah. yeah, and part of that is understandable because you can make intellectual choices, but you just don't have the energy resources to push through all the obstacles will not come to you, you know? Very so, and that is part of, uh, that's part of our anti-introspective age because unless I'm interested which means I, can, I have this moment where I can go into the, you know, as Nietzsche called it, the cave of inwardness and decide what I think and feel about the thing, irrespective of influence, right? Because all we have around us is influences, some positive, some negative. But at all times, we must be able to retract from that. That's the stoical aspect and say, what do I really feel about this? If you are closed off to that level, you are in a major state of, 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 of you have a major problem. Because those influences now are so toxic, right? And so emphatic and so skewed and, you know, tilt, leaned over or whatever the term is, you know, they're with all the social justice stuff and everything, you know, you won't even have the ability to make the choice to feel what's right or the will to then carry it out. So we're going to be left with a zombie level. You know, in my recent article, I talk about this, that there is actually a level so low, the hipster level would fit it pretty much right on. <laughs> We're heading right down into a level of such woolly, woolly thinking. Yeah, woo, woo, and also woo, zombification. Woo. It's it's actually a kind of true meaning of the word zombification. Yeah, all the parts are yeah. there, but they ain't working. <laughs> they're you know, being, they're but, they're being petrified. Literally, they're yeah, being rotted. Right. That's what that That's is, right. right? That archetype of the zombie. It's like a it's a it's a petrification of the, the physical apparatus called the body, but it's putrefying from within. And then right. eventually it yeah. shows up on the outside as this you know, crazy image. But archetypally speaking and energetically speaking, I think you're right. I never thought about it that way, but it's, it's when they say we're like, you know, we have to protect ourselves from the zombie apocalypse. That's not too far off of no, a, a legitimate concern. No, just like when you pull the air out of a balloon animal. Right, it's just lying on the floor. It's just a skinny, emaciated, flaccid thing, right? Yeah. So this hipster generation with their skinny ass legs and their, you know, the whole, the whole weakling aspect of it, the unheroic, unmanly unheroic, nature. Unheroic. Yeah. Oh yeah. These are just like shrunken heads on a tree. I mean, it's literally that. We're we're walking around in 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 a, in the zombie apocalypse in the absolutely correct way that it would be. A lot of people envisioned it in a, in a wrong way. This is the, uh, as you say, it's a plutonic internal. Uh, upheaval the apocalypse is within yeah <clears throat> in in the way that you haven't done the inner work so there's no inner fortitude so everything on the external can look just super duper good R rodeo drive suit on and the leather shoes and you know everything's smashing a great car you know great life style yeah but no yeah. existence no being anywhere to be seen yeah. You're just like a manic in a shop, shop front window dummy you know and I don't want to be around people like that I don't want to have them in my life you know, and I and the optimism in me is to know that many people listening to us right now are not like that and don't like it either. Mm. You know, and we may have to be silent for a while, but we're still clued in. We're still there. I know that. So, you know, I have proof of it every day on enslaved and everything. So, I say, right, I'll say, I'll stick with this then. You know, and not go off and do other things I'm interested in. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll do my writings. You know, new article came out this week. You know, so and and the like I said, the podcasts are. It's an everyday effort, you know, to, to do the next one and, and make them top notch, top drawer, which I promised. And, you know, now that we've got the platform and the funding, it can be done that way. There's so much more to unpack. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm actually amazed at the stuff I have, we have on deck. You will definitely have your back, Ronnie, you know, to unpack these. To. I always love talking to you, you know, and being on your show. There's so much that, uh, yeah, you see, it's very good to speculate. It's very, very good to turn things around and look at it from many, many different perspectives and not be declarative or didactic. You know, there, there, there's right. so many microphone chewers out there just giving you one line and one stock record. This is nonsense. In this field, it's the mind of the beginner. Be able to step back into that state of innocence and receptivity, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. That's the real essence of gnosis or knowledge. I, I love that. And, and I know we're, we're concluding here and it's, it's really late where you're at, but 
one one things you just said is a great a great thing to bring up and we don't have to go deeper into it i'm going to release an article that actually went super deep into this idea of scientism versus science and this is such a critical distinction in our world because it, it's very um it's very uh, telling of it's a phenomenon like rudolf steiner talked about with luciferianism and Aramon and the the forces of darkness that are two individuated but complementary forces one is is hyper deception one is hyper materialism and you know that that's a whole long thing in of itself but it's basically embedded into everything that we've talked about one is hyper esotericism where we're just disincarnated we're not in the body we're disconnected from material we've sworn that off because that's not spiritual of course right um as we kind of mentioned before with the j krishna murti example then you have hyper materialism which is an attempt to strip spirit from matter, which is the atheism re reductionistic. So you have these two sides, but they also, they, they, they are part of us, right? So it's that integration and that acknowledgement. And that's how you defeat Aramon or Mephistoles or that, that archetype that's talked about in all these, these um, you know, cultures is that you don't fight against it because you don't have the resource. That's an ancient eternal energy. We have to find a way to incorporate that energy that lives within us already. And that's the courage, right? I guess that's where I'm going with this is that that's the courage to face the darkness and to literally face it, to face it, embrace it, to know about it. And you talk about this all the time, which is like, you have to know the adversary. You can't shy away. You have to know it and be like a forensic investigator because that tells you about what, you know, tells you about yourself. And then the key is like, where in myself does that, does that, you know, ring true? In other words, where inside of me do I have the capability to create the, the harm or destruction? And then how can I redirect or transmute, alchemize that, that energy in a, in a positive way? How can I turn the darkness into light in other words? And, um, yeah, I just, that was kind of like, I don't know, that just came through that whole Rudolf Steiner perspective because mm -hmm. I've been going deeper into that. And I think it's, it's helped me piece together at least to, to get some kind of language and explanation sure. around this, this undercurrent of the, the dualistic kind of adversarial scenario that we're in. And it's very important to do that because that's one of the key pillars of the universe and consciousness. Well, I call it the contrarium, right? This uh, underlying restlessness that is, is, is the hallmark of spirit. We talked about the other hallmark, which is freedom, right? But then there's a, even a more primordial or co-primordial, let's say. I don't think you can get lower than freedom. It's the ground of all. But coexistent with that is this restlessness that defines spirit. Yes. We experience that as what you said, the light and the dark, right? Another way of saying it, more contemporary language would be Thanatos and Eros, right? Uh, the death instinct and the life instinct. Ah, uh, good, and, wow, yes. Right. Oh. Uh, 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 well, yeah. And, and, and again, they're nothing more than ways of seeing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the people that you meet can look like they're with Eros, but there's that Thanatos, which is something that's, let's give one example of it, where you know, you're never good enough. You know, the whole self-shaming thing, the whole self-sadism thing I've, I've yes. belabored and belabored and belabored. That's Thanatos. The idea that you're not good enough, that your mom and dad was right, the system knows better, the doctor knows better, uh, the, you know, the vet knows better. I'm not in charge of my own health. They told me I've got polymyalgia. I guess I do. Well, it only means many diseases, dear. I've got them. <laughs> yeah. It, it only means many things wrong with you. That's right. Sure, that's right. I have many things wrong with me. All right. You've just, will, you've just talked yourself into having that. Can I talk myself into healing now? Not so easy. So the eros is, yeah, the characteristic, getting out there, socializing, creating, and all. And that's one phase of us. That's one flow of the river. right? Up the, up the higher level of the river, up in the mountains, it was crashing and making a thunder. Don't you know that there's another placid? You further, you know, take it down to the lower regions. And this thing, this entity, this thing called a river, is utterly transformed. Because it needs to be, right, less destructive here for that ecosphere. Up in the hills, it can be doing something else. Why isn't life like that? Why isn't creator like that? Why isn't the spirit like that? Why are we always wanting to, you know, box it into squares or round holes? The thing is so multifarious. And you're quite right at talking about they're linked. There's a, there's a synergy between these two realities. Now, our teachings, our religion, our theology, 
has split them into two opposing realities. Right. And that's, that's the scientism has done the same thing. Scientism wants to look at the universe as a dying entity. Entropy. Entropy. Yeah. But then even if they were right, they're not, but if they were right, I'd still say, but then it was alive at one time. Right. Right. Well, sadly we have to say it was alive. Why aren't you focusing on that then? Right. So it's perspective, right? Yeah. It's perspective. Huh. Actually, you're completely wrong. It's not dying at all, but even by your own argument, you know, uh, so scientism is bollocks, and it really is. And, and luckily, like your Greg Braden's, your Bruce Lipton's, there's a lot of voices out there. I tend to go to earlier ages, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, early philosophy, but it really, do, it really amounts to the same thing. Uh, they're, they're iterating in modern language, showing you the death of this nonsense. The determinism is meaningless, you know, uh, uh, and again, they, they know that free will is, is there. So that there's a lot of good positive things there. But the ancient way of saying it, you're going back to the German mystics of the 15th century and whatever, is that there's an underlying restlessness in spirit. And we, we experience that as duality mm -hmm. in our way, right? It's a little bit removed, right? Hegel would have, and again, I'm, 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 I'm really paraphrasing him here. He didn't say this in any thing I'm saying, but, you know, but, he, but a way of describing it when you sort of factor in Jung and Joseph Campbell and other voices, it's basically three layers. The stereotypical, which everybody knows and everybody is, and that's where you're meant to conform and get your goodies and your approval and even have an easy life. I mean, there's no question that the, yeah. if you just stay on the stereotypical, punishment life's reward, a breeze. Right? It's like what? punishment reward. That's it. Uh, exactly. It's the, it's the Pavlovian aspect, right? Yeah. Then, there's the arch uh, then there's the mythic archetypal, which was brought out by Campbell and Jung. Most people didn't even know about that, even though there were other philosophers like Hegel who did speak about it without using those words, right? Right. And they meant that the conveyor belt upon which the other, it's like the lava flow under which a lot of the other rocks and debris move. But it's so slow, those movements, you don't see that there's this other movement mm -hmm. unless you're highly sensitive. So when I, I always use this word and in, in, in contextualize it by saying, you want to hear those tectonic plates, right? You've got to be sensitive. Then, Otherwise, Joseph Campbell books are going to be meaningless to you. The Hero's Journey, The Monomyth. I don't, yeah, I want you to read it, but I also want you to feel it for Christ's sake. I'm not stopping at their level and saying, here's a description of it. Right. I want you to go out and actually go, like you said earlier, when you said, I had that moment, I had that feeling. Right. It came, mm -hmm. you know, when you're talking earlier. That's what I want. I want people to actually come into direct, you know, contact with it and then let something happen. It could be euphoria, but it could also be tremendous fear. A person who has that experience might feel very disorientated and ungrounded and, and schizoid because of they felt that same spiritual thing as another man feels I'm released. The fool is on the edge of the cliff, remember? Is, does he look frightened? Many others are. So you have, then you'll have to deal with that when that moment comes. And then third level is even a deeper spiritual movement, which is almost imperceptible to humans. It's the Geist is the only word I can give it to, borrowing from Hegel. And I think he would have agreed with this. Ghost in German, right? Yeah, it's spirit. Spirit, okay, spirit. Spirit yeah. or mind, right? A zeitgeist, like zeitgeist, uh, spirit yeah, of the right, age. Right. Spirit uh, of the age. It's there. Uh, German have a lot of words for spirit, right? Yeah. And the geist, is, but the, the word geist was picked because it means a movement or a process, not a static thing, right? Yeah. And then, uh, and again, I'm just sort of paraphrasing, summarizing, condensing, and synthesizing. The whole idea is that that third movement is the only the sage of sage. See, the psychopath is happy, and the, this, this little chart I'm giving you explains a hell of a lot in our world. The stereotypical person is the realm, is the tennis court, it's the swimming pool of the psychopath. He operates there 100%. He doesn't even know or acknowledge the other dimensions. There is nothing to do with him. The sensitive, the psychic, you know, the, uh, the ones we've been addressing, the artist, right? Artists are often aware of this, the poet. They know about that archetypal level. You know, they study the histories of the world and seen that yeah. all races have the same patterning, fathers, mothers, the archetypes, right? You know, the worships, the theology sort of dips down into that archetypal level. It's a kind of an utterance or iteration of the archetypal. Not perfect, but it is kind of, you'd have to agree it's there. But then when you get down to this Hegelian third underlying level, it is another other, that's why I'm a personalist. Because at this point, nothing of the world, nothing of what another person thinks or says, you see, this is the, this is the movement of spirit itself. And my God, what it takes, right, to, to, to be sensitive. You'll never know it completely because it is dark. You know, so to answer your question about the light and the dark, the Arahman and the uh, Orozmud or the, you know, the, the Mazda, whatever, whatever language you want to put on it, the darkness contains the light. 
So uh, no matter how, see, light is not up there in the sky. It's in the deepest, darkest soil. Yes. Right? Otherwise, plants couldn't grow, could they? That little root of light, uh, the root of the plant is activated by light. What kind of light are you talking about? Well, ever read the Goethe's and the Steiner's and all the rest of it? They're talking about a light that is, animates even the darkness. And that's the light you need to contact as a sage, not the luminescence that's over the head of the fool, that bright thing in the sky. That's some. That's luminescence. And that's and that's like the Lucifer archetype, right? Like the, isn't it the shiny object, the deception, the illusion, right? Like not to say the sun's an illusion, obviously, yeah. but no, like no, that, no. But like the the thing that we naturally like, we 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 jump at. We it's like infatuation, like the higher level. Like, right. That's it. The great interesting metaphor I never thought about. Like when we look up and our 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 physiology is pulled up, we're more susceptible to infatuation but when we look down we're more susceptible to that that counterbalance which is like whatever you want to whatever the negative component to that is so there is this eccentricity that you speak about and one thing that i found just interesting is kind of like side point i know we're concluding or we need to conclude but one thing through a recent experience that i had in a relationship and it was a great revelation um somebody said online like never trust a man who is in love because he's in an altered state and I thought to myself, damn, how true. And, you know, you could debate that, but like in the general sense, how true. I wasn't necessarily trustworthy when I was infatuated. My chemistry and my perception was completely, it was like the only thing that existed. Meanwhile, my entire life over here and my work got put to the side because I was infatuated with whatever, you know, call it a fantasy or call it a whatever it was, uh, the expectation attachment, this other person. Um, I don't know. You can be led by the nose. It's so easy to, to yeah. so, and you know, but the way I look at it is this, there are times that need that parking. There's, there's, there's yeah. errancy can That's sometimes lead experience. you over to the lay by. Right. And you do depart from, you know, this is the flow of life I was talking about. It's okay. It's Forgive okay. yourself for the lunacy of your own being. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, don't beat yourself. Learn how to laugh. Yeah. Laughter is, a, is part of seriousness. Joke, right. joke, you know, the whole nonsense of it. I've always said that throughout history, 50% of everything everyone's ever done is absolute insanity. Now <laughs> it's 95%. Get, but you know what? Don't cry. Accept it. Get on with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, don't like it, but, but Learn facts are facts. Yeah. Learn, Learn from it and just yeah. carry on anyway. Do, do right. your dharma anyhow. Right. Even if it was 98 and 99%, do your dharma anyway. The man does not get distracted you know, they have that Zen teaching where they, you know, when the monks, they make these really loud noises and the one who turned around to look, he's failed. Uh -huh. Stay uh -huh. the fuck on what right. the, the calligraphy, right? They join the calligraphy, stay there. And the, the monks, you know, the other teachers would make a lot of racket or noise. And to teach these monks, see, when I tell you to do something, you fucking do it. Yeah. You stay on that, right? Stay, okay. That's to teach them a higher understanding because in a blink of an eye, it can disappear right, on the spiritual path. So, the dark, the one, the third level of the Geist is the level that will distinguish the sage, but he has to change his relationship with light and darkness or Eros and Thanatos. So they start in a raw, stereotypical way. You know, the sun's in the sky, God's in his heaven, everything's right with the world. You know, an evil, all evil is just Satan, right? Mm. And then the, the next one down archetypal is a whole language, a whole book of, of teachings that one has to open in their life, the rites of passage, you know and the great studies of that and then there's yeah, the deepest yes, deepest yes. level and that level is the movement of geist itself purely in and of itself and that's what Schelling for instance the philosopher Schelling was mostly preoccupied with about how we can tap down into that and he decided of course that we really can't what you do is you it's like there's an effervescence or there's like a I don't really know, like a sort of a mist that forms over the movement of the geist and you can inhale that. You can never really get below that cloud bank and see what the thing is itself. And you're not meant to. Yeah. But there's an aroma, right? Uh, uh, intimations would be another word for it. Intimations of immortality, as Wordsworth called it, right? And that, that, that percolation can envelop you. And so the mystic is mad. Totally. Right? Because he's enveloped with, you know, the song, the symphony that's happening. You don't hear it. It's like, Sir, you know, they say Sir Galahad could see the Holy Grail. And he says, don't you hear it? Don't you? And everybody's, all the other knights are going, I don't hear it. That's what I mean. Right? So, and that can walk with you and you can walk with it. But how you walk with it, is it a friend 
Is it a tutor? Is it a tyrant? Right? All of that is in your own personal way of seeing and in your own choice mechanisms, you know, and what you want from it and all of these things. So the journey is a very unusual one, but there are certain rules and parameters, you know? Mm. Yeah, I guess that, well, that, that's, you know, tapping into the implicate, order of things, the divine perfection as David Bohm and Carl Prebrum and those great scientists really discovered through science, which is interesting, authentic, objective, undetermined, always evolving, always continuous science determined, you know, really we're alluding to what the mystics have already talked about. And uh, when I just thought about this quote, and I promise we're transitioning, but I, I thought about this quote as you were talking, which is, you know, a great Nietzsche quote as well, which is that those who were dancing were thought crazy by those who could not hear the music. And I think maybe that's a great conclusion quote to this entire conversation, which I think the, the best title for this conversation is probably something along the lines of walking the truly heroic path or something like that, because that's what I've gathered from all this is, is the essential context content ingredient perspectives to accessing that god force within all of us and you know walking our authentic dharmic path yeah i agree with that yeah and of course these are never last words you know one is unfolding yes. uh, as one goes and it is very important to have a new relationship with duality too much of the eastern nonsense yeah. Certainly the Gnostic nonsense, which has actually been percolating into our society in a very insidious way recently, even more so. They, they don't give up. They're, many, they're a cult that's many hundreds of years old, centuries, and they're still around. They're fabulously wealthy. We've got to be able to discern that their existence is out there. The hermetic way is all about what we've been talking about, that there is a, in ways of seeing, there's a sensitization needed. The body's purity is very hugely part of this, um, purging it. Purgation, remember in the alchemy, purgation, calcination, right. mortificatio, sublimation. Do you know what right. they're all talking about? The soma. Yes. The parasympathetic, right? And, the, and, and all of that. And see, people go, well, I'm healthy now. Yeah, but you might not be tomorrow. You know, see, the person who thinks he's healthy now, he's got this nailed. There's so many pathogens coming in. You can't take it for granted that you can just forget about the body. Right. I know a lot of people do. Uh, but in the East, the good East, you know, the, the, the sort of Japanese martial arts, mm, these mm -hmm. people understood you, could, you must, it's prevention, right? You work with the body because that is the cleansing of the consciousness. Consciousness is, is somatic as well as it is psychic. So by cleansing it and cleansing it, you're keeping that open space. And the more and more you keep that open space, wonderful things will happen. But if you keep piling junk in there and detritus and debris and flotsam and jetsam, which most people are doing, you know, then, uh, then how do you, how the hell are you going to tell me that you're, you know, you have the sensitivity to listen to the archetypal level, which is absolutely crucial, or something even deeper than that? And we are in a culture now that is openly normalizing, you know, bad food, bad eating, diet. Why? Because they know that that's what they want. They want you to have all that, you know, dumpster debris in your be in your pores, in your body, the poisons of sugar, the poisons of alcohol. Uh, uh, meat and all the rest of it, right? They want you to be so soused and poisoned and infected, right? And you're you're playing into this, yeah. And then you call me that I'm shaming you or I'm obnoxious or offensive. What are you talking about? I am trying to kick your ass to get back onto that Siddhartha road, right? It's like any good coach, any good teacher, isn't it? What else are we doing? You know, I wouldn't want to see my kids if I had any or uh, friends being like that. Yeah, you know. So it, it, some of these things are very, very, very rational and, and, and simple, I think. But, totally. you know, we're, we're, yeah, there's a lot of broken you know, plaster covering up the uh, precious China. And we've got to be aware of that. And again, the last message is heed this all because the pathogens are not going to stop. They're going to actually ramp up. They're going to get And bigger. so, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Just talking to yeah. people, even passing them by on the street, sitting in the same chairs as they have at a cafe or restaurant. Have you any idea? You know, I guess your, your people do know this shaking a hand, giving somebody a hug that, you know, you'll come away absolutely, you know, reeking with it. Totally. And you have to know how to, you know, cleanse yourself. Otherwise the holy work, you're talking, let's say, you say, thinking about the holy work up at the top of the mountain and right down here, you're, you're, you're you know, you're mm -hmm. buckling. I mean, what is that? I want to see spiritual heroes. Yeah. I want to be around tigers and, and lions, not, you know, octopi and, and you know, slime <laughs> uh, just crawling along the ground. Thinking, I'm very holy. I'm very spiritual. You can have all the secret yeah. books and you can have all the other stuff on your shelf. It doesn't mean a thing. You've got to apply some of that stuff yeah. and do it in a self-loving way, not a hateful way, not a regimented way. 
you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and then you say, well, yeah, but what about society? In doing those things, you're a model for the next person. That's right. You're not trying to change society. You're changing your own social engineering right. inside of you. And then that will have the ripple effect it needs to. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So great conversation. We'll have to have you yes. back on Unslaved. You know, Ronnie, always enjoy our conversations. You know, and I love the fact that we can rebound and bounce off a lot of different ideas. Keep it really eclectic, you know, yeah. there's a time for tunnel vision on a certain subject. And there's a time for pulling back and examining, taking a reading, like a sort of a depth reading. Where are we in a lot of, a lot of different ways. That's very essential to, to do that as well, to pull back from the canvas and take a kind of a, you know, a gauge, a gauge of where society is, where individuals are, where the educational systems are, you know, what's happening in, in all sorts of areas of psyche and so much. Yeah, well, Michael, look, I, I appreciate it so much. You know, before we connected, you were someone that I would consider a, a, hero, a hero of mine through the life that you lived, the work that you've done, the devotion to it, the impeccability to it, and how that affected me. And then when we connected, just your, your generosity, your graciousness, your humility, um, you know, just a very rare teacher archetype that I really you know, resonate with deeply. And I appreciate um, these interactions. I appreciate the fact that I can be so relaxed and just hang back and just talk and have an incredible conversation and pitch and catch with you. Um, so it's definitely very, very mutual. And I'm grateful that we can make this happen. Thank you for responding back to me and, and um, suggesting that we carry on today, even in the wee hours of the night. Um, it just, you know, this, this is just an incredible conclusion to that entire repository of interviews that I've done. And um, yeah, I don't know what else to be said other than the fact that, you know, I want to share your work with everybody. And, um, you know, you have the Unslaved podcast. Um, so for those that don't know, let's make sure that they know where to go and what to look for. Um, because if you enjoyed this, this interview, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, dive into the unslaved library. There's so many dimensions and so many different things that you and David Whitehead are getting into with world leading thinkers and so many different niche areas that quite honestly, those conversations wouldn't be happening without it. Um, and so, yeah, let's make sure that everybody knows what to yeah. do with that. Well, I got my own website. There's about, oh, I don't know, is like a, over a dozen websites, right? But you can get to them through michaeldesarn.com. I like to modulate everything so it's very clear and, you know, uh, separated. And then we have the, our own podcast at unslaved.com. And we just come off the back of a mini, mini series on psychology, female psychology specifically, but tying in a lot of you, Carl Jung. I'm definitely going to have to go over that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a four part. It's been planned a while. And it's just a continuation of, of, of two books I wrote on that subject uh, and it's always evolving. So we decided to do those four, then, you know, break away, do something else. We just had Matt Presti on. We'll be doing something on the tarot coming up very soon again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's a lot of interesting stuff there and a lot of other stuff in, in, in the pipeline on Unslave coming up because of the platform being right now. Yeah. I can uh, unpack things that have been really shelved for way, way too long. Subjects I studied even many years ago, but knew that the platforms weren't right, you know, to get into it, you know, so prisoners of childhood uh, and, and there's more psychology stuff coming along, you know, yeah, a lot of good stuff on its way, pretty much the stuff that I've always wanted to do. And, and, and just in the last, you know, very short time we've been able to do so. Yeah, David and I, we, we explore that. It gets very deep. It's like top drawer stuff, you know, it's top drawer stuff mm -hmm. all the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as things become more facile and shrink wrapped and monotonous and stuck record and headline chasing, you know, in the media right now. And even in this movement, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of problems in this movement right now. So we're trying to create an oasis where we methodically quietly, you know, and uh, with great deal of, uh, you know, sort of a discrimination, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also reverence, like you said about these teachers from the past, I may have studied them, but I know that a lot of people don't know who these Irish Schramms and Irish Newmans are and Ayn Rand's and, you know, we've done stuff on great women as well. So, you know, and we'll be d diving into that even deeper. There's some good stuff on existentialism. I have a new book coming out, you oh, know, but uh, yeah, call it's uh, existentialism and the search for meaning, oh. you know, which we'll be getting into a lot of things we've actually been talking about here, Yeah, you know, in that book. So yeah, it, it's really, it's a really good time of uh, producing a lot of new cutting edge stuff, mm. not, not going over, 
and reiterating again and again the same thing, but moving into completely new territory. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's just so much on the way. So yeah, be mm-hmm. be glad, glad for people to check that out. They're welcome to come over and see what we've got there. Yeah. Yeah. So unslave.com. And um, yeah, I, there's, I could just keep going on with you. You could easily make this another hour or two. Um, the temptation is there, but you know, we got it. We got, it's been about, it's been exactly two hours right there. Synchronicity. Oh. It's been literally two hours. So um, very appropriate if I may say so. And um, I look forward to your work. Man's search for meaning, I think is one of the most pivotal books of all time, not to mention the the crisis of meaning being the the core of what kind of the existential issues in our world are. So I hope that this interview, this conversation really helped provide more intrinsic meaning for those that are on the search as we all are on the journey of self-discovery. And please go to unslave.com. Absolutely incredible. We did a great episode. I was on a while back and um, really fun. Got into some stuff that I don't normally get to get into. And um, I look forward to checking out all that. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Always. And um, always, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure, mate. Mm-hmm.